some visuals here. So let me see if I can share my screen here. Can you see something else? Yes. Okay, so I'll use the full screen mode here. I can no longer see you guys, but can you see the slide? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, so this is actually uh, an idea the title Social Mindfulness. It's a, it's a concept that I um, explained last year in last year's conference, so I'll, I'll, I'll go through it quickly. Um, but it's a concept that I've been using, and I'm using it in a, in a book that's coming out soon on socio-environmental context around mining in Latin America. And by, yeah, I'll explain in a moment what I mean by social mindfulness. But first, in terms of the context in which socio-environmental contexts are happening in, in, around extractive capitalism, there are three key traits, key, key trends that I want to highlight. First is, of course, one that you are all talking about uh, the mineral super cycle that's of course happening at, at the global scale so that's also meant that Latin American economies have shifted quickly and decisively towards mineral exports and commodity exports over the last 15 years so the, cycle, the super cycle has hit Latin America in, in very important ways uh, and the ideological and the political reflection of this economic trend is what uh, an Argentinian scholar of Marcelo's Bampa has called the commodities consensus. Meaning that both governments on the right and governments on the left are pretty much the same in terms of basing uh, and putting their hopes uh, of generating revenue uh, on exploiting actively and quickly mineral resources. So that explains why Although governments like Venezuela, and Ecuador, uh, Nicaragua, in Argentina, on the one hand, which are left-leaning governments, and governments like Colombia, uh, like those of Colombia, uh, Chile, Mexico, which are on the right of center uh, point of the spectrum, have very different social policies, but very much alike in terms of uh, how they deal with socio-environmental conflicts and. Uh, around mining and around the promotion of mining um, and the welcoming stance vis a vis mining transnational corporations. So, this is, this is the commodities consensus that Maristela Advanza talks about. And that explains why some of the cases that I'll uh, refer to in a moment come from countries which are otherwise pretty leftist in, 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 uh, in, um, in economic uh, terms. And they have policies that are very similar to those of countries which very different um, economic policies on, on uh, uh, that run along uh, the lines of neoliberalism, like Colombia, Mexico, and, and um, Chile. And the third point that uh, has come with the mineral super cycle is the new developmental state. This is a concept that's been articulated mostly by Brazilian scholars to explain the type of capitalism that obtains these days in, in Brazil, in, in which um, the state has again taken a leading role um, that's grown considerably and that's uh, resorted to the types of, of, of more interventionist tools that used to be popular in Latin America in the from the 1930s through the 1970s. So this is the socio-political context in which the uh, cases that I'm going to refer to in a moment have, has happened. So on to social minefields. Uh, in my work, what I refer to uh, as social minefields is uh, the proliferation of sites across the region, and this really happens across the region. There is no country in Latin America that's been exempted from this, uh, from this uh, train except maybe Cuba, uh, for historical and political reasons. Uh, and I mean social minefields both in economic um, and sociological uh, senses. In economic senses, these are sites, frontier economies, that revolve around resource extraction. It's not, only, it's not only mining, but it can be also oil extraction, it can be large development projects, resource 
um, exploitation projects like l large hydroelectric dams. Um, and I mean this term also in sociological in a sociological sense in that there are social minefields in that uh, they're pregnant with violent interruptions. So when I was last year in, in South Africa around the time of the Marikana massacre, that uh, of course looked it's very dramatic, but it didn't it did sound and uh, look familiar to me because I had seen similar situations you know, as a human rights lawyer as well in Brazil, in Ecuador, uh, and in Colombia. And in Colombia, actually, one of the minefields, and I'll give you a sense of exactly what type of size I'm talking about. This is, these are the three cases uh, in the book that I'm publishing on, on social minefields. The first one is in the Brazilian Amazon. This is a large hydroelectric dam. It would be the third largest hydroelectric dam in Belo Monte uh, that started in 2001 and that's been contested by indigenous peoples. So as you will see from now on I refer to indigenous peoples uh, and, I, and I'll explain what I mean by indigenous peoples because I understand it's a different concept from the uh, way that indigenous peoples understood in, 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 in Africa. Uh, but indigenous peoples in the Amazon have persisted the construction of this large uh, dam on the basis that it will destroy their culture and, and their economies. And this case has been quite prominent. It actually, we went all the way to the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, which is the regional human rights body, uh, which intervened and asked the Brazilian government to stop the construction of the dam until they consulted with the local indigenous peoples because of this particular legal um, figure of ILO Convention 169, prior consultation uh, with indigenous peoples before the, any, any uh, undertaking, uh, economic undertaking in their territories. Yeah. So prior consultation has been a, a key component, legal and political component, of every major struggle around mining in Latin America. And it's also, it's expanded even to peasant communities, not just indigenous communities, but also peasant communities. Second case uh, in Ecuador, uh, Sarayaku, the indigenous people that have persisted the oil exploration in, the terri in their territories, and this case has also gone to the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, which last year ruled in favor of the Sarayaku people and asked the Ecuadorian government uh, to carry out full consultation with the local indigenous peoples uh, uh, to obtain their consent before authorizing oil drilling in their territories in the Ecuadorian Amazon. And finally, the third case, the third instance of social minefields that I use in my work is a case in, in, in Colombia, the Urra uh, Dam, which is at the, located at the heart of the Colombian Civil War. Uh, this is where the right-wing paramilitary squads were headquartered and continue to be headquartered in northern uh, Colombia. This is a case in which uh, the Emberacatillo indigenous movement also uh, opposed the construction of the dam on the basis that they had not been consulted uh, as per the 1991 constitution and the ILO Convention, International Labor Organization's Convention 169, which dates back from 1989. The dam was built in the early 1990s, uh, but it led to this uh, uh, suit before the Constitutional Court of Colombia that has hinged around reparations. How to uh, pay reparations, compensation to indigenous peoples which have been heavily affected by uh, large development projects. So by now you must be asking why this protagonism of indigenous issues and indigenous uh, people's issues in conflicts around mine? Uh, and, uh, answer is that uh, the mineral super cycle hit Latin America just as uh, the national legal regimes were recognizing the multicultural, the pluricultural um, in nature of Latin American societies. So before the early 1990s, all constitutions in the country, in, 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 throughout the region would say, well, the, the Colombian or the Guatemalan, the Mexican nation is one, right? After uh, the mobilization of indigenous people's movement in the 1970s, 1980s, and the wave of international legal instruments on indigenous people's rights, 
namely ILO Convention 169-1989, and more recently, the Declaration on Indigenous People's Rights in 2007, the UN Declaration on Indigenous People's Rights that was approved in, in 2007. Uh, a core component of legal regimes in Latin America has been the recognition of indigenous people's rights, which has uh, hinged around indigenous people's right to be consulted uh, before any large development project takes place in their territories, including mining, or, or even before any uh, national law is approved by Congress um, that affects directly their interests and their, and their livelihoods. And this is what I called in my other article of Mississippi.gov, the, sort of the legalization of conflicts around um, indigeneity and the country. And I'm actually paraphrasing uh, Jean and John Komarov's work here. They talk about uh, ethnicities.inc in, in their book, that's the title of the book, in which they argue that ethnic identity, indigenous people's identity in particular, have, have become commoditized, commercialized, uh, through the intellectual property, through ecotourism, through the types of, of uh, land leases and property over resources that you guys have been talking about in this seminar. So what I, I argue that parallel to that economic problem, there's a legal process going on of um, legalization of indigenous people's rights. And in Latin America, that taken the form of uh, legal cases, legal suits before high courts, even before the Inter-American Human Rights Court, on private consultation, like the ones that I just uh, mentioned. Yeah, but this is, importantly, uh, usually in internet domain, .gov means government, but here I'm using .gov as a proxy for government, meaning that there's legal struggle over the regulation of this type of company. Uh, so it's not just national constitutions and ILO Convention 169, but it's also corporate codes of conduct that these days, if you look at any um, the large uh, mining multinational company uh, code of conduct or even the website, they will have some language on consultation with indigenous people, with local communities. If you look at the operational guidelines of the World Bank or the American Development Bank, they have even developed specific guidelines on how to consult with indigenous people uh, in uh, projects that are funded by those banks. So there's a, there's a whole industry of regulation of consultation, which I refer to as the uh, uh, And this gives this has portraits that I'll go through very quickly because I want to move on to the comparison with, uh, with Africa. Of course, there's legal pluralism by definition because there are competing uh, rules and legislation on consultation uh, and participation in <laughs> mining conflicts. Second one is a procedural law. Right? This, this conflict, is, they teach around the details of how to consult with indigenous people. They tend to take on a very legalistic procedural law. It means how, how long the, the consultation should last. What, uh, who, who are the uh, legitimate participants in that in consultation? Uh, what to do when the community that's being consulted does not agree with the government decision to go on with the project and so on and so forth. Uh, importantly, law has been a means of commensuration uh, in, in all of these practices. And here I want to stop for a moment and emphasize that the types of issues that are at stake in most of these um, movements and struggles are not the type of issues that I understand tend to come up in, in Africa. They're not mostly around revenue sharing. They're not mostly around the nationalization of resources, although that, of course, is the political picture. But they're usually about a more sort of radical opposition to resource extraction per se. So, so many of these... Can, can, yeah? can I just uh, rudely interrupt just to point out that you've got five minutes left? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, since some of the claims, most of the central claims of most of the indigenous uh, peoples and the indigenous movement at large are about 
not extracting resources, then what it takes two quite different views of development and livelihood. And actually, the right of, uh, the right of Mother Earth have been constitutionalized in Ecuador and Bolivia in recognition of those claims by the indigenous people. Um, recently, you may have heard about the Ecuadorian government plan uh, to raise funds from the international community in compensation for not exploiting oil in the Amazon uh, uh, jungle. Uh, that was the Yakuni uh, problem. So, because of there are two very different ways of going about uh, exploiting resources or not exploiting resources in these territories, law has been the, the only way to meaningfully uh, talk about the procedure uh, to consult with indigenous people. But still, the substantive differences um, are lurk behind. Instead, this and and focus in my last uh, few minutes on South South divide. Uh, so. My, my hope is that this type of, of comparison will get us to uh, be able to talk about a cross divide uh, within the South. It's a lot more common to talk about, uh, to make comparisons between the South and the North, so the stories of in the case of Latin America compare what's going on in, the, in Canada and, and, and the US uh, versus what's going on in Latin America. But, uh, my hope in this, in this work is that we'll be able to develop meaningful Africa, Latin America, and comparison South to South uh, conversation. Now, in order to do that, I think it's important to recognize at least three potential differences, three potential debates. First one is temporal. What you guys, what we're experiencing here, for example, for uh, with Anglo Gold, we're actually litigating some cases against abuses by Anglo Bull in indigenous people's territories. You guys experienced a hundred years ago. So there's this huge gap, a hundred year gap uh, between the, the processes that, may, uh, that pose some uh, challenges for comparisons, but also can uh, offer some opportunities for uh, lessons from what happened in Africa that's happening now. You guys are, are dealing with acid uh, Drainage. We here in Latin America are worrying about the possibility of acid drainage, uh, and the fact that it's already happening in South Africa, for example, can uh, substantiate claims of risks, environmental risks in Latin America. These things. Second one is a sociological divide. Um, when I presented, when I first presented the the, the article that on ethnicity.gov in, in at SWAP a couple of years ago. I was very interested and very surprised that the category of indigenous peoples didn't mean at all the same thing in, in the South African context. I mean, it has some sort of problematic connotations that it doesn't have uh, in, in Latin America. So uh, it's key to be aware of, of, of the uh, different uh, social groups that are at, at stake here, that are waging this, 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 uh, these struggles, and, and even the concepts, how they don't travel well uh, across regions. And finally, there's this political divide I already alluded to, which is the fact that the issues that are being raised, that are being pressed by movements, are not necessarily the same. As I said, uh, the most visible um, conflicts and cases and social minefields, like the ones that I alluded to, uh, are about not exploiting resources, not just sharing revenues of those resources or, or nationalizing the resources, but about the possibility of not, not going down the commodities route, not going down the structure. And I have one minute, my last minute, I'll just make a case for three types of translation. So my, my, uh, my argument is that in order for South-South comparisons to be possible and to be meaningful, we as scholars and, uh, and some of us who are also uh, active in the human rights world need to uh, practice three types of translation. First one is of course linguistic. And we just had Gavin and Carl were key participants in a, in a global workshop for activists and human rights activists and uh, here in Colombia. And of course we have to have bilingual um, translation all the time, so that's not a, a small challenge, but it can be met. Second one is more tricky, yeah. because it means 
bridging different scholarly traditions. Uh, in Latin America, uh, we tend to uh, cite what is produced mostly in, in the US. We, we read each other uh, um, less frequently than we should, but we definitely uh, don't read and are not aware of what's going on in, in African scholarship on this issue. So that's another, uh, that's another challenge. And finally, and with this, I'll end political translation. And this one is quite challenging, meaning how to bring together or at least bring in, in, in contact with each other different types of political claims. And uh, Carl, when he was here, he asked this question to an indigenous leader who would argue forcefully against resource extraction. And he says, but what about other uh, social groups that would be interested in resource extraction but want the revenues to be shared uh, fair. Uh, and, and clearly there was a disconnect between the two types of claims and the two types of art. So I'll, I'll end there because my time is up and I'll be happy to entertain any questions. Thank you very much, Cesar. Okay, um, we're now going to uh, open this discussion to the uh, floor. Uh, Technically, the session ends at. I think we've got we've got at least uh, quarter past four. I don't know if there's going to be any. No concessions. No concessions. Right. Okay. So um, let, let's just uh, have a show of hands so I can get some sense of whether. Um, I'm going to have to deal with bunches of questions at a time, or individual questions. Okay, well, I've got Devin there. Devin, go ahead. Thanks, Carol. Um, this is a question for Cesar. Um, I want you to tell us a bit more about what's happening in Bolivia and Ecuador. Ecuador, in particular, seems to be a case of uh, both countries, as you say, have granted the earth constitutional right, which is very exciting. It's a major step forward. But Ecuador seems to be now retreating uh, under the forces of you know, extractive capitalism and Bolivia to some extent. Perhaps if you could just enlighten us a bit more about, about that. Is it a retreat? Is it, are we all, is it a hopeless case or is there some hope in, the, in those examples? Can I just check, are you hearing this, Cesar? Yes, I am. Okay. Are there any other uh, questions waiting to be asked? Uh, okay, can I ask you to uh, reply very uh, briefly to that uh, question? Sure. Thanks for the question. Um, these are two very interesting and, and challenging cases because they're not monolithic. I mean, they're, uh, Ecuador and Bolivia are leftist governments with very progressive socioeconomic agendas. Right, so what uh, Ecuador has achieved over the last uh, 10 years or so in terms of reduction of poverty, uh, reduction of inequality, the building of infrastructure, and so on and so forth, is quite remarkable. Likewise with uh, Bolivia, although to a lesser extent. Now, those two governments came to power on the shoulders partly of very powerful indigenous movements, uh, uh, with which they parted ways after, the, after uh, the presidents were in office, meaning Correa in Ecuador, fell out with the indigenous people's movement in 2008, when the indigenous people's uh, movement asked them to include in the 2008 constitution a clear provision guaranteeing the right of indigenous peoples to determine uh, the fate of exploitation of uh, natural resources in their territory. And everything there's been a, a huge divide, a huge um, animosity between the government and the indigenous people. If you read, for example, that the New Left Review issue of a couple of issues ago had a, a very poignant interview by President Correa, who called indigenous people the, the um, childish left. Uh, that was, of course, not taking well, sort of a racist comment, so on and so forth. Uh, but it also gives you a sense of internal tension. That also applies to, to Bolivia. I'll focus on, on Ecuador and Ecuador, say something very quickly about Bolivia at the end. So Ecuador, at the same time, has 
going on with the oil exploration in the Amazon and launched this very interesting uh, project on a specific loan in the Amazon area of the Amazon in which it promised not to uh, drill for oil in exchange for the international community paying half of the royalty, of the revenue that the Ecuadorian state would have obtained from exploiting those uh, uh, resources. But very clever, very interesting, very promising. Now, it just, uh, the Ecuadorian government just announced that it's, uh, that it's uh, doing away with that part because it said it, it, it got tired of waiting for the international community uh, to pay up the price of not putting those resources. There's, uh, I think that, that's a promising model. Uh, Ecuador was not, was never fully serious about it because it was also granting um, oil uh, concessions around that area. Uh, but there's also a failure of the international community. You know, it's, it's a promising idea. And, and it's a promising, and what Ecuador has promising legal causes on the rights of nature. Right? That in practice, however, the 